now we introduce a fundamental concept in electrostatic called capacitance. If we bring the electric charge Q to an isolated conductor far from other conductors then the charge will be distributed over its surface such that the electric field strength E vanishes inside the conductor. The distribution of charge over the surface of a conductor is unique and there is no other way to distribute the charge so that the field could be cancelled out within the conductor. Hence, if we bring the same amount of electric charge Q to the charged conductor, it will be distributed over the surface of the conductor in the same way as it was distributed in the first time. Otherwise, it would produce a non-zero electric field inside the conductor. In general, if different amounts of charges are brought on an insulated conductor, then the charges will always be distributed over the surface of the conductor in the same way. That is, the ratio of the surface charge densities at two arbitrary points on the surface of a conductor is always the same. As a result, we can assume that the electric potential of the conductor is proportional to the amount of electric charge distributed over its surface. Indeed, by increasing the amount of charge distributed over its surface, we can increase the electric field strength at every point in the vicinity of the conductor. Then the work done while a unit positive point charge is brought from infinity or the ground to the surface of the conductor, that is the electric potential due to the charge distributed over the surface of the conductor is increased as well. This finding can be formulated by stating that the amount of charge Q on the conductor must be directly proportional to the electric potential phi of the conductor, where the proportionality constant C is called the electric capacitance of the conductor. The capacitance C of a conductor is determined by the ratio of the amount of charge Q to the potential phi, and its value is equal to the amount of charge that the conductor needs to attain so that its potential can increase by unity. The larger of the capacity of a conductor, the greater the amount of charge can be stored in the conductor at a given potential. A conductor has a unit capacity if electric charge of 1 coulomb increases the potential of conductor through 1 volt. The unit of capacity is equal to 1 coulomb over 1 volt and called farad after the English physicist Michael Faraday which and abbreviated by the letter F. Since 1 farad is a large value, normally its submultiples are in use, such as micro, nano and pico farad, that is 10 to minus 6, 9 and 12 farad. Capacity is independent from the charge and the voltage but it depends on the shape and the size of the conductor. This statement can be demonstrated by the following simple experiment. We can bring a chain with a handle made of insulating material into contact with the top plate of an electroscope and charge the whole system formed by the electroscope and the chain. Then the golden leaves of the electroscope spread apart indicating a given amount of charge distributed over its plate. However, if we lift the handle of the chain while the chain still remains in contact with the plate, then the distance between the end of the golden leaves decreases. Since the amount of charge stored in the system has not changed, we must conclude that the change in the geometrical properties of the system reduce the electric capacity of the system. By applying the definition of capacity, we can immediately derive the capacity of an isolated conducting sphere. We already determine the electric potential phi outside a charged conducting sphere which is equal to 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught, times the total charge Q of the sphere divided by its radius R. If we substitute this result into the definition, we can write the capacity C of an isolated conducting sphere as 4 pi times the vacuum permeability epsilon naught times the its radius R. That is the capacity of a sphere is proportional to its radius. For example, if we approximate Earth as a sphere of radius 6,370 kilometers, then this formula gives 700 microfarad, and only a sphere 1,500 times greater than Earth has a capacity of 1 farad. This example illustrates that a single conductor isolated from other objects has an extremely small capacitance. However, in practice there are many areas where devices are required that are capable to store a great amount of electric charge at low electric potential relative to the potentials of other objects in their vicinity. Such devices are called capacitors, and their operation based on the fact that the capacitance of a conductor can be increased by bringing other bodies close to them. For example, let us bring a metallic body into contact with the top plate of an electroscope and charge the system formed by the conductor and the electroscope. The gold leaves of the electroscope will spread apart indicating the presence of electric charge. As we bring another grounded metallic body near the system, the gold leaves will decrease with the decreasing distance between the system and the grounded conductor. We can interpret this phenomenon by examining the distribution of the electric field between a charged conductor and the ground. If a grounded conductor is brought into the electric field due to the charged conductor then the field causes a separation of charges in the grounded conductor. The charges induced in the grounded conductor modify the distribution of the electric field strength around the charged conductor, that is the distribution of the field lines emanating from the conductor. Let us compare the electric field between the charged conductor and the ground when the conductor is isolated and when the grounded conductor is in its vicinity. 
It can be demonstrated by measuring the electric field around the charged conductor that the field lines are denser over its surface close to the grounded conductor than between other parts of its surface and the ground. As a result, the work done while a unit positive charge is brought from the ground to the charged conductor will be less than the work done when the charged conductor is isolated or far from the grounded one. In other words, the electric potential of a charged conductor can be reduced by bringing a grounded conductor close to it. This is the reason why the combination of charged and grounded conductors has a greater capacitance than a charged conductor alone. Two conductors placed close to each other therefore form a capacitor, where the two conductors are called the plates of the capacitor. The capacitance of a capacitor is determined by the geometry and the arrangement of its plates. Furthermore, capacitance also depends on the medium between the two plates. In order to prevent external objects from having an effect on the capacitance of a capacitor or just minimize their effect, it is desirable to choose the shape of the plates of the capacitor and their arrangement with respect to each other such that the electric field due to the charges on the plates is concentrated between the plates. This condition can reasonably be satisfied by two parallel flat plates separated by a small distance known as parallel plate capacitor, two coaxial metallic cylinders called cylindrical capacitor, or two concentric metallic spheres known as spherical capacitor. If the electric field is concentrated inside a capacitor then the electric field lines emanating from one of its plates must terminate on the other plate. As a result, the same amount of opposite electric charge is stored on each plate. One of the most important requirements for capacitors is the highest possible capacitance even with small size. As already mentioned, capacitance can be increased by modifying size that is increasing the area of the plates, or modifying geometrical arrangement that is decreasing the distance between the plates. We can also increase the capacitance of a capacitor if we place a medium between its plates that has a dielectric constant greater than 1. We note that there is a maximum limit of charging a capacitor determined by a maximum voltage between its plates. Besides capacitance, maximum voltage is also an important property of any capacitor that can be applied without causing electric breakdown of the dielectric material between its plates. For if this maximum or breakdown voltage is exceeded then arcing will occur between the capacitor plates, and the dielectric material and the capacitor with it may become damaged. There are many different types of parallel plate, cylindrical and spherical capacitors applied in practice, such as block capacitors, variable capacitors, electrolytic capacitors, ceramic capacitors, organic dielectric capacitors and so on. What we consider to be the very first capacitor was discovered by the German cleric Ewald Georg von Kleist and independently by the Dutch scientist Peter von Mischenbroek of Leiden in 1745 and 1746, and the apparatus built by them is called the Leiden jar. In its earliest form it was a glass bottle that is partly filled with water and the cork sealing the bottle was pierced with a wire running into the water. A brass rod with a brass sphere on its free end was also used instead of the wire. Here the glass served as the dielectric material of the capacitor. Later jars had sheets of metal foil wrapped around the inside and outside of the glass and no water. The outer sheet was connected to earth and the inner one had a suitable connection with the wire or brass rod by a metal chain. The jar could be charged by connecting the free end of the wire or the brass rod to a friction machine producing static electricity. In order to determine the capacitance of capacitors of different geometries, we use the definition of capacitance stating that if the electric potentials over the plates of a capacitor are given by phi 1 and phi 2, then the capacitance C of the capacitor is equal to the ratio of the amount of charge Q of the capacitor to the difference between the potentials phi 1 and phi 2. Here the charge plus Q is distributed over one of the plates of the capacitor and the charge minus Q is distributed over its other plate. The voltage V through the capacitor is defined by the difference between the potentials phi1 and phi2, and the capacitance C can also be written as the charge Q divided by the voltage V. Now we determine the capacitance of the three basic types of capacitors starting with a parallel plate capacitor. Let us consider a parallel plate capacitor with two parallel plates of area A separated by distance D, where the capacitor has an electric charge plus Q on one plate and minus Q on the other one. If the distance d is much smaller than the sides of the plates, we can take the electric field to be nearly uniform between the plates by neglecting the bending of the field lines close to the sides of the plates. We already examined the uniform electric field between two parallel infinite plates due to the charge plus q and minus q uniformly distributed with the surface charge density sigma over the plates, and we found that its magnitude e is equal to the surface charge density sigma divided by the vacuum permittivity epsilon naught. Since the distribution of charge is uniform over the plates, the surface charge density sigma is equal to the amount of charge Q on each plate divided by the area A of the plates. Then the electric charge Q stored in the capacitor is given by epsilon naught times A times E.
the potential difference phi 1 minus phi 2 between the two plates, that is the voltage V through the capacitor is equal to the magnitude of the uniform electric field E between the two plates times the distance D between them. If we substitute these two equations into the general expression for the capacitance of capacitors, we can write the capacitance C of a parallel plate capacitor as epsilon naught times the ratio of the area A of the plates to the distance D between them. In other words its capacitance is directly proportional to the area of the plates and inversely proportional to the distance between them. The formula obtained for the capacitance can also be verified by experiments measuring the charge Q of the capacitor and the voltage V through the capacitor. If the capacitance C of a parallel plate capacitor is already known with high accuracy, then we can determine the dielectric constant of vacuum from the geometry of the capacitor. The next type of capacitor for which we determine the capacitance is a cylindrical capacitor that consists of a conducting cylinder or wire of radius R1 surrounded by another coaxial cylindrical shell of radius R2, where L is the length of the cylinders. Let plus Q and minus Q be the charges on the inner and the outer cylinders, respectively. If the length L is much greater than the radii R1 and R2, then we can neglect the bending of the field lines at the two ends of the capacitor for the electric field between the cylinders produced by the charge distributed uniformly over their surfaces. As a result, the electric field depends only on the radius R measured from the axis of the cylinders and points radially outward from the axis. Let us choose a cylinder of the radius R as a Gaussian surface where the radius R is between the radii R1 and R2. Since no electric field line passes through the bases of the cylinders, Gauss law states that the surface integral of the electric field E over the Gaussian surface given by the magnitude of the radial electric field E, times the area of the curved surface of the cylinder chosen as Gaussian surface, that is 2 pi times its radius R, times its length L, is equal to the total charge Q enclosed by the surface over epsilon naught. If we express the magnitude of the electric field E from the Gauss law, we obtain 1 over 2 pi times epsilon naught times the length L times the charge Q over the radius R. The difference between the potentials phi 1 and phi 2 over the conducting cylinders, that is the voltage through the capacitor is equal to the line integral of the electric field E along a path connecting the two cylinders. If we substitute the expression obtained for the magnitude of the radial electric field into the integral, we can write it as Q over 2 pi times epsilon naught times L, times the integral of 1 over R from R1 to R2 with respect to R. The integration gives the natural logarithm of the ratio of R2 to R1. By inserting this result into the capacitance formula, we can state that the capacitance C of a cylindrical conductor is equal to 2 pi times epsilon naught times its length L, over the natural logarithm of the ratio of the radius R2 to the radius R1 of its cylindrical surfaces. This formula also shows that the capacitance of a cylindrical capacitor depends on its geometry. The third type of capacitor for which we determine the capacitance is a spherical capacitor made up of a solid or hollow spherical conductor of radius R1 that is surrounded by another hollow concentric conducting sphere of radius R2. The charge plus Q can be brought to the inner sphere by applying an insulated thin wire passing through the outer sphere, and the charge minus Q can be brought to the outer sphere. Here we also assume that the charge is uniformly distributed over the surfaces of the spheres, and the electric field therefore depends only on the radius R measured from the center and points radially outward from the center. If we choose a spherical shell of radius R as Gaussian surface where R is between R1 and R2, then Gauss law states that the surface integral of the electric field E over the Gaussian surface given by the magnitude of the radial electric field E, times the area of the sphere chosen as Gaussian surface that is 4 pi times the square of its radius R, is equal to the total charge Q enclosed by the surface over epsilon naught. By expressing the magnitude of the electric field E from the Gauss law, we obtain 1 over 4 pi times epsilon naught, times the charge Q over the square of the radius R. The voltage through the capacitor that is the difference between the potentials phi 1 and phi 2 over the conducting spheres is equal to the line integral of the electric field E along a path connecting the two spheres. If we substitute the expression obtained for the magnitude of the radial electric field E into the integral, we can write the voltage as Q over 4 pi times epsilon naught, times the integral of 1 over R squared from R1 to R2 with respect to R. The definite integral is equal to minus 1 over R, evaluated at the upper and the lower limits of the integral. The reduction of the fractions on a common denominator gives R2 minus R1 over R1 times R2, which can be inserted into the capacitance formula. As a result, the capacitance C of a spherical conductor is equal to 4 pi times epsilon naught, times the radius R1 of its inner sphere times the radius R2 of its outer sphere divided by the difference between R2 and R1. If the radius R2 of the outer sphere tends to infinity, the power expansion of the ratio in the formula reduces to R1 and we regain the capacitance of a spherical conductor in the limit. 
In practice it is important to combine capacitors of different capacitances such that their plates are connected or wired together in various ways. There are two basic combinations of capacitors where they are connected either in series or parallel. The figure shows two capacitors of capacitances C1 and C2 connected in series. If we connect a voltage source of V sub a B to the terminals A and B of the combination of the capacitors, then electrons will propagate through the conducting wires from the plate 1 of the first capacitor to the plate 2 of the second one producing the charge plus Q on the plate 1 and minus Q on the plate 2. Since the plates 1' prime and 2' prime are not connected to the voltage source, no electric charge will leave these plates or arrive at them. However, the electric fields due to the charges accumulated on the plates 1 and 2 modify the distribution of charge on the plates 1' prime and 2'. Prime. For if we apply the principle of conservation of charge in the volume enclosing the connected plates 1' prime and 2', prime, the electric fields induce the charge minus Q on the plate 1' prime and the charge plus Q on the plate 2'. Prime. Hence, each plate of the capacitors connected in series has the same amount of charge and the voltage V sub a C between the nodes A and C is equal to the voltage V1 through the first capacitor given by the ratio of the charge Q of the capacitor to the capacitance C1 of the capacitor. The voltage V sub C B between the nodes C and B is equal to the voltage V2 through the second capacitor given by the ratio of the charge Q of the capacitor to the capacitance C2 of the capacitor. Since the voltage V sub a B is equal to the sum of the voltages V sub a C and V sub C B, or the sum of the voltages V1 and V2 through the capacitors connected in series, it can be written as Q over C1 plus Q over C2. Here we express the ratio of the voltage V to the charge Q as the sum of 1 over C1 and 1 over C2. Now the question is what capacitance C a single capacitor must have if the difference of the potential V is applied between its two plates given by phi A minus phi B, then the charges plus Q and minus Q could be stored on its plates. In other words, we can ask when a capacitor of capacitance C is equivalent to two capacitors of capacitances C1 and C2 connected in series considering their net or equivalent capacitance. For the capacitance of the equivalent capacitor we know that the charge Q stored in the capacitor is given by the product of its capacitance C and the voltage V applied between its plates. We can divide this equation by Q and C and express V over Q as 1 over C. If we compare this expression with the result obtained for the two capacitors connected in series then we see the condition of the equivalence, that is, 1 over the capacitance C of the equivalent capacitor must be equal to 1 over the capacitance C1 of the first capacitor, plus 1 over the capacitance C2 of the second one. Then the equivalent capacitance C is given by C1 times C2 divided by the sum of C1 and C2. We can generalize this result for n capacitors of capacitances C1, C2, ellipsis, Cn connected in series, and write that 1 over the capacitance C of the equivalent capacitor is equal to 1 over C1, plus 1 over C2, plus ellipsis, plus 1 over Cn, or the sum of 1 over Ci from I equals 1 to n. Then the capacitance C of the equivalent capacitor is given by 1 over the sum of the reciprocal of Ci from I equals 1 to n. In other words, the reciprocal of the equivalent capacitance of capacitors connected in series is equal to the sum of the reciprocal of the capacitances of the individual capacitors. It follows from these formulae that the net capacitance of capacitors connected in series is always less than the capacitance of any of the capacitors. If each capacitor connected in series has the same capacitance then the equivalent capacitance is equal to the capacitance of the capacitors divided by their number. Now we determine the equivalent capacitance of two capacitors of capacitances C1 and C2 connected in parallel. As the figure shows, the difference between the potentials of the two plates of each capacitor is the same, but the amounts Q1 and Q2 of the electric charge stored on their plates are not necessarily equal to each other. We can write that the charge Q1 on the plates of the first capacitor is equal to the capacitance C1 of the capacitor times the voltage V applied between its plates. Similarly, the charge Q2 on the plates of the second capacitor is equal to the capacitance C2 of the capacitor times the voltage V applied between its plates. Then the total charge Q of the two capacitors connected in parallel is given by the sum of the charges Q1 and Q2 of the individual capacitors, which is equal to C1 times V, plus C2 times V, or the voltage V times the sum of the capacitances C1 and C2. This gives the equation stating that Q over V is equal to C1 plus C2. We can ask the question again what is the capacitance C of a single capacitor equivalent to the capacitors of capacitances C1 and C2 connected in parallel, where the amount Q of charge given by the sum of the charges Q1 and Q2 is stored on its plates if the voltage V is applied between them. It holds for the capacitor equivalent to the two capacitors connected in parallel that its charge Q divided by the voltage V applied between its plates is equal to the capacitance C of the capacitor.
By comparing the two equations with each others, we conclude that the capacitance C is equal to the sum of the capacitances C1 and C2. Generally, if n capacitors of capacitances C1, C2, ellipsis, Cn are connected in parallel, then the capacitance C of the capacitor equivalent to them is given by C1, plus C2, plus ellipsis, plus Cn, or the sum of Ci from I equals 1 to n. In other words, the equivalent capacitance of capacitors connected in parallel is given by the sum of the capacitances of the individual capacitors. As opposed to the case of capacitors connected in serial, the equivalent capacitance of capacitors connected in parallel is always greater than the capacitances of the individual capacitors. By connecting more than two capacitors to each other we produce more complex combinations, and these combinations can be reduced to the two basic forms in some cases, capacitors connected in series or parallel. As a result, some combinations of capacitors can be transformed into simpler forms by applying the equivalence transformation of capacitors. For example, in the figure the capacitor of capacitance C1 is connected in series with capacitors of capacitance C2, C3 and C4 connected in parallel. The capacitors connected in parallel have the equivalent capacitance C' prime given by the sum of C2, C3 and C4, and we can replace their combination with their equivalent capacitor of capacitance C'. Prime. Since we have obtained the combination of two capacitors in series, the equivalent or total capacitance C of the whole system is equal to C1 times C' prime divided by the sum of C1 and C'. Prime. In the next example we show a more complicated combination of capacitors which can also be simplified by applying the equivalence transformation of capacitors connected in series or parallel. We can perform this transformation in several different ways, and here we start with the capacitors of capacitances C1 and C2 connected in series and the capacitors of capacitances C5 and C6 connected in parallel. In the first step we introduce the equivalent capacitors of capacitance C a given by C1 times C2 divided by the sum of C1 and C2 for the capacitors connected in series, and the equivalent capacitor of capacitance C b given by the sum of C5 and C6 for the capacitors connected in parallel. In the second step, we apply the equivalence transformation for the capacitors of capacitances Ca and C3 connected in parallel, and the capacitors of capacitances C4 and Cb connected in series by replacing them with the equivalent capacitor of capacitance Cd given by Ca plus C3, and the equivalent capacitor of capacitance Ce given by Cb times C4 over the sum of Cb and C4. Now we have the capacitors of capacitances Cd and Ce connected in parallel, and we can reduce their combination into the capacitor of capacitance C given by the sum of C D and C E. As a result, we can replace the original combination of six capacitors with a single equivalent capacitor of the total capacitance C when examining how much charge can be stored in the system for a given voltage V applied on its terminals. The equivalent capacitance C of the whole system is a unique expression of the individual capacitances depending on the topology of their combination, that is the way how they are connected to each other. However, some combinations of capacitors for example the one seen in the figure, cannot be reduced to the problem of capacitors connected in serial or parallel. Although the equations describing the charges of the capacitors and the voltages through them can be solved for such a combination, it is simpler to apply the so-called star delta transformation for it which we will discuss later. The concept of capacitance described above can be applied in the cases involving only two plates or electrodes over which equal but opposite electric charges are distributed. In general, if a system consists of charged conductors or electrodes then the electric potential of every conductor depends on the charges distributed over the surfaces of all the conductors. As an illustration of the general case, let us consider the conductors or electrodes 1, 2 and 3 with charges Q1, Q2 and Q3, which have the electric potentials Phi1, Phi2 and Phi3 with respect to the earth or ground denoted by zero. Then the system of conductors consists of the electrodes 1, 2 and 3 together with the ground considered as the electrode 0 of zero electric potential. By supposing that the properties of the media around the electrodes are independent from the electric field due to the charge stored in the system, we can express the potential of each electrode as the superposition of the individual fields due to the charges distributed over the surfaces of the individual electrodes, since Gauss law is linear in the electric potential phi of the field. As a result, the potential phi i on the electrode i can be written as a linear function of all the charges, that is the sum of the coefficients of potential a sub i j, times the charge q j on the electrode j from j equals 1 to the number n of the electrodes. This equation can be interpreted as a vector equation, where the vector of the potentials of the conductors is equal to the product of a matrix with the elements given by the coefficients of potential and the vector of the charges on the conductors. Then the potential phi i of each electrode in the example where i is equal to 1, 
2 and 3 is given by a matrix equation, where the 9 coefficients of potential form a 3 times 3 matrix. Each diagonal element of this matrix represents the contribution of the charge on a given conductor to its own potential. The diagonal elements therefore describe the self-capacitance of the conductors. The off-diagonal elements a sub ij of the coefficient matrix represent the contribution of the charge on the electrode i to the potential on the electrode j, and are known as mutual potential coefficients. The matrix A sub ij is a symmetric matrix, that is A sub ij is equal to A sub j i for all i and j from 1 to n. This property immediately follows from the reciprocation theorem stating that the sum of the charge q i on the conductor i times the potential phi prime i of the same conductor from i equal t to n, is equal to the sum of the charge q prime i on the conductor i times the potential phi i of the same conductor from i equals 1 to n. This theorem will be discussed in details when we study energy in electrostatic field. Here the potentials phi i of the conductors are generated by the charges q i distributed over their surfaces, and the potentials phi prime i of the same conductors are generated by the charges q prime i on them. If we insert the expressions of the potentials phi i in the left-hand side into the theorem, then we can see that the matrix of the coefficients of potential must be symmetric. Usually, the inverse problem can also be discussed where the potentials of the electrodes are known. By inverting the matrix of the coefficients of potential, we can write the charge qi on the electrode i as the sum of the coefficient a over minus 1 sub ij times the potential phi j. That is, the vector of the charges on the electrodes is equal to the product of the inverse matrix of a and the vector of the potentials of the electrodes, as seen in the example. Here the elements of the inverse matrix of a have the unit of capacitance and are called partial capacitances relative to the ground. Since partial capacitances can be negative, an equivalent scheme is used where each pair of conductors is replaced by capacitors with given capacitances, and the amount of charges on the conductors are expressed by the differences between the potentials of the different electrodes including the ground. That is, the charge qi of the electrode i from i equals 1 to n is given by the sum of the coefficients c sub ij, times the difference between the potentials phi i and phi j of the electrodes i and j from j equals 0 to n. Here the potential phi 0 of the earth is equal to 0 and the relationship between the inverse matrix of the coefficients of potential and the coefficients C sub ij is the following. The diagonal component of the inverse matrix in the ith row and column is given by the sum of C sub ij from j1 equals 1 to n, whereas the off-diagonal elements of the inverse matrix with indices i and j are equal to minus the coefficients C sub ij. In the example, the voltage between the electrodes 1 and 2 is equal to the difference between the potentials phi 1 and phi 2. Similarly, the voltages between the electrodes 1 and 3 and between the electrodes 2 and 3 are given by the difference between phi 1 and phi 3 and the difference between phi 2 and phi 3, respectively. In the figure we indicated both directions between the conductors which can be applied to determine the voltages. The coefficients C sub ij are always positive and can be interpreted as capacitances of the equivalent scheme forming the capacitance matrix of the system of conductors. Again, the diagonal elements of the capacitance matrix correspond to the contribution to the charge qi on the conductor i caused by its own potential phi i, providing the self-capacitance of the conductor. The coefficients c sub ij where i and j are different represent the contribution to the charge on conductor i caused by the potential difference between this conductor and the conductor j. This contribution is equivalent to the capacitance of the capacitor formed by the electrodes i and j, and these coefficients are called partial capacitances. In the example we have three equations expressing the charges Q1, Q2 and Q3 in the terms of the potential differences which we can interpret as follows. The charge Q1 is decomposed into three parts in the first equation, the amount proportional to the potential phi1 with the self-capacitance C sub 1 0 of the conductor 1, the amount proportional to the voltage phi1 minus phi2 between the conductors 1 and 2 with the partial capacitance C sub 1 2 the of these conductors, and the amount proportional to the voltage phi1 minus phi3 between the conductors 1 and 3 with the partial capacitance C sub 1 3 of these conductors. We can give the analogous interpretation of the two other equations as well, which shows that each electrode has one self-capacitance and two partial capacitances. For a system of n electrodes, each electrode has one self-capacitance and n-1 partial capacitances.